Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today I'm continuing my research into the programmable input-output features of the RP2040. Last time, I built a VGA interface for the Pico and ran some video demonstrations that had been written by Raspberry Pi. However, I have to sharpen some skills before I even begin to write my own video display programs. The first of those skills is working with the C, C++ software development kit and the PIO assembler. So why don't you join me as I try to convert a PIO program I had originally written in MicroPython to C, C++. Let's talk about the differences between implementing PIO in MicroPython and C, C++. I'll simply use C for the rest of this video because all the programs we're working with today are written in straight C. Incorporating PIO into a MicroPython program is really pretty simple. After you identify the libraries that are needed, the PIO assembler is initialized. The PIO program is then named, followed by the PIO script. Inside of the main MicroPython program, you instantiate the PIO routine and then start it. Pretty straightforward. However, C is much more complicated. Here the PIO program is a separate file. After naming and writing the PIO script, the required libraries are identified. This is followed by a helper function that will be used to pass initialization data from the main C program to the PIO program. Inside this function, various interface scripts that bind the PIO program to the RP2040 are called. At the end of the helper function, the PIO program is initialized and the PIO state machine is started. However, this is all controlled by the main C program. In this script, additional required libraries as well as the PIO program are identified. Then, inside the main program, information for compiling the PIO program is conveyed to the PIO assembler and the PIO program data is initialized. Finally, the C program is given the green light to start. But wait, there's more. We still have to compile and link our code, other programs, and the required libraries from the SDK into code that will run on the RP2040. What do we get for all our troubles? Well, the PIO program runs just as quickly regardless of whether MicroPython or C is used. However, the main program runs much faster in C, and that makes all the difference when performing high-speed data manipulation. I'll highlight the various programs and scripts needed to implement PIO in C. To do that, I'll convert a very simple MicroPython program to C. I'll start with example one from episode five of my PIO series. This program uses set, no-op, and jump statements to blink an LED attached to GPIO pin three entirely within the PIO program. I'll put a link to this and all other programs in the description below. The syntax for the PIO C program is consistent with that of standard C. Comments are delineated by slash slash or a slash star star slash pair. Labels end with a colon and all other statements end with a semicolon. Let's compare the MicroPython and C PIO scripts. The C PIO is identified by the dot program statement. I call this one EP7 jump. Next, create a label for the jump target. I called it main loop. Note the syntax differences. Here, I turn the LED on and delay the program for 31 more state machine clock cycles. Next are seven no-ops, each taking 32 state machine clock cycles. Then I turn the LED off, followed by six more no-ops. With the added delays, each statement takes 32 state machine clock cycles. Finally, we jump back to the label main loop. For both MicroPython and C, libraries need to be added. In MicroPython, the libraries are part of the MicroPython interpreter that resides within the RP2040 memory, and we call them out at the beginning of the program. However, in C, the libraries are part of the C, C++ SDK. We'll configure the state machine by passing code to the SDK with these statements. Let's go through them. Please note that much more information can be found in section 4.1.15 of the C++ SDK datasheet. 
we define a helper initialization function to instantiate an instance of the PIO program based on a handful of parameters received from the main C program that we'll cover later. This function uses application programming interfaces, or APIs, to connect the PIO functions to the PIO hardware. This statement tells the PIO assembler to get the default configuration for a PIO program, things like side set and wrap. This will be changed later by the assembler if needed. This statement maps the state machine set pin group to one pin called, ironically, pin. This is part of the information the main C program passes to the helper function. This connects the PIO to the GPIO. This statement sets the GPIO pin direction as an output. This statement sets the state machine clock rate. Here, it divides the system clock rate by the desired frequency passed by the main C program to obtain the clock rate divider, which is passed to the RP2040. Next, we load the configuration into the RP2040 and then start the state machine running. This text is saved as a .pio file under the project folder. Now we'll look at the Companion C main program. Here we specify the libraries we need as well as the PIO program. Within the main program, we first choose one of the two PIO instances we want to use. In this case, the first one, PIO0. This will give us the start of the PIO script from the beginning of the PIO0's program memory. Next, we assign the blink pin as GPIO pin 3. This assigns a value to our desired state machine clock frequency, in this case 2500 Hz, which is about as slow as we can go. Now we find an available state machine, claim it, configure it to run the PIO program, and then start it using the helper function we included in our .pio file. This is saved as a .c file under the project folder. Next is to take these two text files and compile and link them into a file that will run on the RP2040. This is not an insignificant task. It can be done using individual commands, but the CMake process makes it a bit easier. However, mastering CMake is not trivial. It took me a lot of trial and error to figure it out. In the last video, I used the predetermined CMake process to compile the video demonstrations. However, I decided to set up my own directory to help me learn more about the CMake process. There seems to be many different ways to set up the file structure to make the building process easy. This is how I did it. I'm sure it's not the best, but it worked for me. I set up a subdirectory called David Examples in the same directory as all the other Pico C programs. In David Examples are folders for each project I'm working on. Inside each project folder are the C and PIO programs, as well as the Pico SDK import and CMake lists files. CMake lists tells CMake how to import files into the build folder and what to do with them during the compiling and linking process. Let's look at the standalone CMake lists file I set up. First, list the minimum version of CMake. In this case, I selected version 3.19 since that's the version I'm currently using. Next, include pico sdk import.cmake, which helps manage the environment path and provides some error reporting. I'll set up the project name using the project statement. Then I set the C standard to 11 and the C++ standard to 17. Next, I initialize the Pico software development kit. Now it's time to manage the sources and targets. Add the PIO program as an executable. Then generate a header for the PIO program. Set the sources as the PIO and C programs. Also include the required link libraries. The PIO add extra outputs function declares that you want a UF2 file to be created, which is what the Pico executes. Next, 
let's go through the CMake and Make process. Since I'm using Windows, I'll open a Visual Studio Developer Prompt window. First, if it hasn't been set up before, define the path for the Pico SDK folder. See Episode 6 for more details on how this is done for a Windows machine. Don't forget to close and open a new Developer Prompt window to make the environment changes stick. Next, navigate inside the project file and create a build directory. Then navigate inside the build directory. Type cmake-g, quote, and make, make files, close quote, double dot. This means use cmake to generate, dash g, a file for the nmake process called makefile and grabs the source programs from the directory above the build directory, double dot. That command brings the required files into the build directory and generates the makefile script that tells nmake how to compile and link the source and other files into a file that can be downloaded to the Pico. You may have errors while generating this step. For me, it's usually been a problem with the path. Chase down the errors, locate the files, and make sure the CMake process can see them. Sometimes, I'll temporarily move files into the project folder to see if that's the problem. That helps me pinpoint the paths I need to clean up. At this point, delete all the files in the build directory before you try the CMake command again. Otherwise, CMake uses CMake cache to speed up the process, which can, and often will, just repeat the error you're debugging. Next is the nmake command. This actually compiles the C and PIO programs and links them to the other files. Here, I have an error in the PIO program. I'll fix the error and try nmake again. Once the CMake process has been successfully completed, you don't have to do CMake again unless you need to alter the file structure. If you have to run CMake again, don't forget to delete all the files in the build directory before you start. Let's look at the files in the build directory. These files were assembled under the build directory as part of the CMake process. It includes the CMake intermediate files, the Pico SDK, the PIO assembler, and the ELF2 to UF2 file converter, which converts the assembled code to code that will run on the RP2040. These files occupy about 22 megabytes and are brought into every build file. This is where economies in memory could be realized with a different file structure. However, I chose this file structure so I could understand what was happening. The rest of the files are created during the nmake process and include the UF2 file that can be downloaded into the Pico. Now that we've compiled the program, let's try running it. I'll connect the Pico to my computer using a USB cable while holding down the boot button. After the Pico shows up as a separate device, drag the UF2 file into the Pico. The file will download into the Pico which then reboots and starts the program. As you can see, LED3 is blinking. This was a very simple PIO program. Let's add a little more complexity by adding GPIO control of the blinking. The MicroPython version of this program was demonstrated as example six in episode five of my PIO series. In this program, we use three labels and three different jump types to control the LED. We use the Y scratch register to execute a loop 31 times as a delay when turning the LED on or off. In addition, we use a GPIO jump pin to control the blinking based on the status of GPIO pin 16. In the helper function, I added a variable to transfer the number of the jump pin, and I also added the API to set the value of the jump pin. In the companion C program, we set the blink LED to GPIO pin 3, the jump pin to GPIO pin 16, and the state machine clock cycle to 3000 Hz. 
Except for adding the jump pin number to the instantiation function, the rest of the C program is unchanged. After the CMake and NMake process, let's download the UF2 file into the Pico. Note that the blinking halts when GPIO pin 16 is pulled high, which is shown by the green LED. Thanks for joining me today. I made a lot of progress on understanding how to use the C, C++ SDK to develop programs that use the RP2040 programmable input output. We developed, compiled, and ran a couple programs. The next step is to figure out how to transfer large quantities of data between the main and PIO programs. This will involve the transmit and receive FIFOs, the input and output shift registers, and maybe even direct memory access. So stay tuned! If you like this video, or you think someone else might, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. The more likes this video has, the more YouTube will recommend it to others. Also, please leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon!